Welcome to Hopscotch, a Latin American literature in translation. And today I'm very pleased to have with me my colleague here from here at UBC, University of British Columbia, Arturo Victoriano, who is an expert on Dominican literature. And uh, we are going to be talking about this book by Dominican Rita Indiana and her novel Papi. Arturo, thanks so much for doing this. Thank you for having me here. And I love my, your series, by the way. I love your series of videos. That's, and it's I'm, good. I'm going to steal some. I, I'm so pleased that, that you can be part of it. And yes, they're, they're made to be stalled and, and reused. And my first question about Papi, very open. How would you suggest approaching this text? It, it is a great uh, question because uh, Papi is a multi, now that we use multiverse, <laughs> it's, a, it's a multiverse uh, novel, right? You can approach it from different angle. Uh, normally when I uh, teach Papi, I do it from the perspective of Dominican migration. Uh, I haven't taught the novel in a while, uh, but uh, in my previous in my previous jobs, I taught the novel and basically to what are the effects of Dominican migration out of the island, especially to the United States, where is the largest Dominican community outside the island is in the United States, especially in the area of New York. Uh, so much so that uh, we call the ones that are raised there or born there, we call them Dominican Yorks, very much like uh, the Puerto Ricans uh, born and raised in New York, they are called New York Ricans, right? So Papi is an example of that migration is, is, is like you said in your video is is a lot of excess, and um, you know this material uh, reproduction of things that they multiply. Like uh, to to make another reference to the eighties, they are abound in the novel. They multiply like the gremlins, right? I don't know if you remember the movie The Gremlins. <laughs> you will if you if you give them water after midnight, they multiply. So objects here in this novel. They, they multiply. So I normally approach the novel from the perspective of the Dominican migration. And who, who is Papi? Who is this Dominican York that returns or is supposed to return, right? Uh, the novel starts, like, like you said, that uh, Jason, you know, <laughs> uh, the kid waiting for Papi to return. Right. So one thing we need to talk about perhaps a little later is, is the context of the 1980s. I'd love to hear more about... Um, the Dominican Republic in the yeah. 1980s, but this notion about migration. So, um, uh, Papi Papi moves to, to the United States, but he doesn't exactly, you know, cut all his ties. Right? He goes and he comes back. He goes and yeah. he comes back, and he's left. Well, he's left part of his family. His whole family is, yeah. is is a complicated family, but he's left, in particular, the narrator, the daughter behind. Yeah. But he goes and he comes back. He maintains this relationship with the Dominican Republic. So I suppose it's not like the old style, you know, uh, migration from, I don't know, Europe to the United States, where you fully yeah. established a, a new life in the United States. This is a much more, a much more fluid migration, which includes yeah. these returns to the Dominican Republic, in yeah. which you show off, you show off everything that you've managed to achieve yeah. in the United yeah. States. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's what uh, uh, used to be called in the eighties, uh, con un pie aquí y el otro allá. It was, it was even a merengue, a very famous merengue, like with one foot here and another one there, right? And uh, the merengue uh, is a merengue from the eighties. Will uh, just oppose the two different lives, right? And and because the the bulk of the migration comes from the countryside. So there's there's one part in the merengue that uh, the singer says, well, there in Dominican Republic, I woke up with the cock uh, crowing, right? The rooster crowing, and here is a siding, right? Uh, so they just opposing those two. But it's a huge migration that start from uh, the dictate the fall of the dictatorship. So starting in 1962, it hasn't stopped. Right. It's it's a constant moving now. The last numbers are about uh, twenty five percent of the population of Dominican Republic is outside. But because of the uh, 
trans modes of transportation, right? Um, planes, not boats anymore. So it's easier to go uh, and, and come back, right? Uh, my colleague, Lorgia Garcia Peña from the Dominican Studies side, uh, she called that by vein in her uh, latest book. So it's also that, that notion of coming and going. And um, I remember Juan Flores uh, used to call that, the, he used to talk, he wrote about it, the cultural remittances that the migrants that return bring. And then Papi is also, you can approach Papi from that uh, perspective too, the cultural remittances, what the Dominican York brings to Dominican society and what it takes to New York, right? Or to the United States. So it's a, it's a, it's that just a position, right? So in the novel, the daughter is there waiting. And that was a very typical, it was a very typical thing in the eighties, right? Uh, one of the parents will go uh, and it's a gender thing, right? Because the, the migration to the United States, it was the men that will go and, you know, work in the factories and all that, and the women stay behind. But then there's a migration to Europe in the eighties, especially from the South, that are the women that go to Europe to work in mm -hmm. Spain and Italy and Switzerland as domestics and sex workers, and then the men stay behind. So it happens on both sides. And um, I think Juno Diaz has a story in Drown that it's called Aguantando. And I, I think holding on, right? I mm -hmm. think that's the state in which this family finds themselves in, right? The puppy is overseas and the daughter holds to the dream that you know, Papi will be will come back and will come back with material goods right. that will make that will make life uh, easier. And that that happened in reality in the eighties, right? That migration now, even now, about ten percent, eight percent of the total GDP of the country comes from remittances, like one point five billion dollars or something ridiculous like that, and and in a small amount so people will send you know two hundred dollars a week uh fifty dollars here hundred and fifty dollars there that because of the exchange rate uh it 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 makes a difference right and and you can see that in the novel where she's waiting and I think there's that part when she gets the new toy and she's sitting in her uh Pool, right? She's she's there with the a snorkel and waiting, and then Papi doesn't show up. Right? It's a you you never know if he's showing up or not, right? With with the migrants, you knew that they would show up, and they show up in in a specific dates, right? They will come for Christmas, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you you always go home for Christmas, so they will come for Christmas, and they will come in the summer. Mm -hmm. And they get some vacation. So this is a novel, again, written by a child of the 80s. With that, it's a very good portrait of what Dominican society was going through in the 80s, right? The economy drops. Uh, there's, there's in 1984, there were huge riots over bread uh, prices. And I think she, at some point, the narrator mentions that in the novel. That the, you know the police come and and kill some people. The, the rumor has it that they, nobody knew how many people got killed, mm -hmm. but people say like what's well, two hundred people got killed, and that was in nineteen eighty four when the uh, monetary fund came in with uh, adjustment, like it happened in the rest of Latin America and the Caribbean. So th that enters into the novel the fact that the economy is so bad in the island. And one possible salvation it comes from getting remittances from overseas. So, so as you say, we have these economic remittances, and that's somehow that's sort of leveraging that economic inequality, because somebody can go from the Dominican Republic, but this is a common in Central America and the, and the Caribbean, from El Salvador, and so on, 
and, and work for relatively low wage U.S. standards, but sending even these yeah. relatively small amounts of money back to the Dominican Republic or again El Salvador or or, or Mexico or, or wherever um, that can sustain a, quite a large number of people, a, a relatively large family, or it can, can in principle. And then there's the, what, what you were talking about. I'm interested in the, the cultural remittances. In other words, the what's sent back is not just money, but also, but also ways uh, of life, ways uh, of life, music, and then also ways of dressing. So, so this was this was we were talking about this before we started recording, the notion that when the the migrant returns for the holiday or for Christmas or whatever. There's this spectacular sort of sh they have to, they have to do this spectacular show of success. You were talking about these gold chains, which could even perhaps yeah. be rented to sort of yeah. show that all this trauma and breakup of the families and migration and so on was somehow yeah. worth it. I wonder if you could say more about that. Oh yeah, and, and, and this was I I grew up in a in a uh, working class. We called it that in those days it will call barrio marginal or a ghetto or whatever right i grew up I, I grew up in a working class neighborhood and i remember being a teenager um seeing the people that will leave for new york and and people were waiting for la residencia right waiting for the paper the permanent resident paper and then they will go to new york and they spend i don't know 2 3 years without coming back and then three years down the road, they will come in December uh, for Christmas. And then they will have these gold chains and 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 uh, polyester, uh, silk polyester shirts. This is, this is late 70s, early 80s, right? And they will have a different style of hairdo, right? Uh, curly hair with Afro sheen or something like that. And it was all to display this wealth that they have acquired uh, in the United States. And you were not allowed to come back uh, without money. So mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to show that you did well in the States by the gold chains, the clothes, by bringing gifts to the family, you know, uh, we used to have this expression that somebody smell like New York, right? We we have this idea that there's a certain smell that it comes from New York, and it, you know, uh, soap. I remember that particularly soap, ivory, or or Irish spring that we didn't have in the in the Dominican Republic, they will, uh, Dominican George will bring that, but they will also rent a car, right? This idea that Papi is a dealer, right? It's a car dealer. It was 80s and 90s, car dealership, the, the selling of used cars was one of the, one of the things that uh, Dominican George will, will enter into, right? Uh, they will buy the cars, uh, bring it for cheap cars, like, you know, cars that are not allowed to circulate due to regulations or whatever. They will bring the car and they will sell it and they will put the dealer, you know, in in some neighborhoods, even in their own home. They will have five or six cars and they will, you know, buy and sell the cars. All that, it was, it created an idea that migration was a way not the idea. It is actually it's a way of social mobility, mm -hmm. right? And then there's 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 a pushback to the Dominican jerks, right? Uh, certain uh, right wing intellectuals will say the Dominican jerks uh, destroy the fabric of the republic because they bring these bad costumes, right? Uh, uh, boys are rebellious. Girls are not complying with the sexual mores of the country. Uh, and on the left, critics will say the Dominican jerks um, create a bad example because this excess uh, consumerism of the empire, right? They, they mm -hmm. bring the imperial view of society that you, you have to be wealthy. So they get 
they get blasted uh, left, right, and center. And but at the same time, they are looked with envy sometimes because mm -hmm. you know, in reality, they had more money that we did, and you can see that in the novel when. Uh, the daughter say, my papi has more of everything than yours, right? right? It's, it's this idea that um, the more you have, the better you are because, you know, you left the country and traveling was a huge thing. And it was a taunt uh, when we were playing, uh, you know, in the basketball court, it was a taunt. Like, I have traveled, you haven't. Right, tú no había how. That's what we say. Tú no había how. So you you are not a nobody, but you, you are you know a little bit below me because I I, I got into a plane, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I remember that because I never got into a plane until I was twenty seven, right? My first trip out of the island, I was twenty seven, and it was this idea that you know these people have traveled, they have gone in a plane. So the, there's there's so much here. This is this very rich. Thank you so much. Um, what, one of the things is, so you were saying that you were talking about the economic crisis in the early 80s, which again affected uh, large parts of, of, of Latin America, crisis of, of debt and, and foreign exchange and, and food riots. And yet at the same time, prosperity identified with the US is so close you can smell it. I, I love that idea, smelling of, of, of New York, right? And mm -hmm. perhaps also with the, with TV, with adverts, and so on, we see in the novel uh, the characters are dazzled with the spectacle and the smells and the sounds mm -hmm. of of a of a prosperity that seems almost but not quite in touch. Yep. And Pappy yep. becomes the representative of, of of that as he comes back yep. and and, yep. and treated as a as some kind of almost savior figure, right, or somebody who could yep. who could help other people make that final move. I wonder if you could say yeah. more about that. Again, the sights and smells and sounds of, I guess, sort of globalization and of yeah. U.S. prosperity as they affected yeah. the island or, or the Dominican Republic in the 1980s. Absolutely. And I think that's another angle that you can approach this novel is from the sensorial aspects, right? Um uh, there are parts in which you you can smell the 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 smell of New York, and she mentions some certain brands of shampoo and 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 um, soap, local and uh, in the states, but also the sound. Uh, let's not forget that the Rita Indiana has a very successful career in music, right? Uh, as a, as a musician, and the sounds that she puts in the novel are pretty much the sounds of the 80s, right? Uh, you will you have uh, merengues, and merengue is a constant. She's, she's referring, she's marking the time with merengue songs, and in those days, and they are back, LPs. And then there's, there's a part in which she's talking about El Conjunto Quisqueya, with her, with their tight pants on national TV, and that was that was pretty much par for the course. They will show merengue bands at at noon in a, a show called El Show del Mediodía, and it was it was the most watched show at noon uh, from twelve to one or twelve to two, and merengue bands will come and, and, and perform. So you have the sounds of music, uh, the sound of merengue, but also the sound of a city, especially Santo Domingo, that starts changing in the 80s. And it's a, it's a kind of a paradox because you come from the 12 years of Balaguer, 1966 to 1978, right after the American invasion of 65, and the economy, gets better, right? Uh, Balaguer, as you said in your video, Balaguer is, is, is in a very ambivalent legacy in that sense because during the 12 years, they exterminated the left, basically. But at the same time, there was a program of economic 
uh, prosperity, uh, infrastructure, special infrastructure, and agrarian reform. So peasants have access to land and uh, soft loans and stuff like that. But then the 80s, the bottom fell off, right? And I remember the crisis in 89. We have no electricity. We have no gas. We have no sugar. The, these are the years in which Rita Indiana is a teenager. So th there's also that, that aspect, right, of an economy that is start tanking after people have a living memory of the good years of mm -hmm. the 70s, where things were cheaper, the dollar was almost on par, and then we find ourselves paying six, 12 pesos for a dollar. So, and that creates again that, that gap between what people get in the island and what people get in the United States. So again, another way of migration in the 80s. I, I, like, wonder if you could, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that political context. So Balaguer actually featured, well, he, he's mentioned in, in the book towards the end. Yeah. He, he comes back, as I understand it, in 1986. He's reelected, yeah. but he's almost totally blind. He's, yeah. a, he's an old man. Yeah. But he's, the, he's this link back to, well, before to Trujillo, right? You yeah. know, he was Trujillo's yeah. right-hand man. There's, yeah. It's almost, though, though they're not related, it's like a dynasty which stretches across from the yeah. 1930s yeah. Yeah. to the late 1980s. And, but there's this sense that it's, by this time, exhausted, literally literally so frail, so worn out. He's still handing, he himself is handing over keys to new developments yeah. and so yeah. on. But but maybe doesn't quite know what exactly is going on around him. Can you say a little bit more about Balaguer and that political history? I'm working on on those 12 years now. My current project is about the, the literature that is coming out in those 12 years. And it's, it's proven to be uh, very challenging in the sense that politically, uh, we are in the middle of uh, the Cold War, but also in the middle of a dirty war against the left. And by some accounts, 3,500 people were killed during those 12 years. So it's it's a very violent period, but at the same time, there's uh, economic growth. He loses power in 78. It's a very difficult, tense moment. Uh, Jimmy Carter and Carlos Andres Perez have to basically intervene and stop a coup d'etat. And the PRD, the Partido Revolucionario Dominicano, comes into power in 78. Uh, the exiles come back. Uh, political prisoners are free. Uh, the freedom of the press is guaranteed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But by 1986, they have foot riots in 84, a president that committed suicide, a president that is uh, entrapped by corruption, right? And Balaguer comes as the savior. So my generation, mm -hmm. I was born in 69. My friends from school were Balaguer's first voters. Her, their first vote was for Balaguer in 1986 because, you know, he's old. He was 80 at that time mm -hmm. and almost blind. And one of the phrases that he used in that campaign is, I'm not going to the National Palace to, to put a needle into to put the threat into a needle. Yo no voy al palacio a insertar agujas. A, yo voy a gobernar, right? So I'm going to govern. I'm, I'm not going to put a needle, a threat through a needle, right? And he stayed in power till 1996. Through the 1990s elections and the 1994 elections were fraudulent elections, so bad in 94 that he had to take a deal to cut the mandate in two years and have free elections in 96, right? So it's a very controversial figure because he was also a writer. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, he won prizes in 1956. He won a prize for his history of Dominican literature. But like you said, he was with Trujillo from the beginning. He was one of the intellectuals that draft the manifesto of the Trujillo coup d'etat in 1930. 
And during the Trujillo era, he was Minister of Foreign Relations, he was Minister of Education, Vice President, and ended up being the president when Trujillo got killed. Mm -hmm. So he managed also that transition between the end of the dictatorship and the first free elections. So it's a very controversial and ambivalent figure. And for Rita Indiana, uh, I'm so glad that she's doing this, is a constant subject in the last three novels and the short story, uh, short story collection called Los Trajes. It came out a couple of years ago, and it's, again, the 70s. Because culturally, things are happening uh, in music, in literature. There's a lot of experimentation, but there's an avoidance of politics. Right? Mm -hmm. Writers are, because the politics are bloody and real. People are getting killed uh, literally every day. So it's, it's this ambivalent figure that comes back in the 80s as the grandfather, right? And mm. he used to walk, I think his, that is in the novel. He used to walk with a suit and a tie and a hat in the uh, Mirador Sur. It will be sort of, I don't know, like a big park, sort mm -hmm. of Central Park. Chapultepec or something like that. It's a big part in the city that he built, right? It was his part. And he will walk because he had uh, uh, problems with the legs, so he have to walk daily. So they will go there and he will walk and he will conduct, um, uh, it, the narrator put us in the novel, he will conduct government business while getting his daily walk. Something that Trujillo used to do. Trujillo used to do that. He will walk at night along the Malecon, and then he will get that route. And he will conduct businesses, uh, government business, while walking. So, yes, it's a dynasty, even though Balaguer famously said in his uh, inauguration speech in 1966, I'm not here to wear Trujillo's boots. And my dad used to say, no, he wore Trujillo's suit. Right. <laughs> not the booty, he was for everything. Because he was they were very difficult years in the sixties and, and seventies, right? So we're we're almost out of town to out of time. Uh, again, this has been fa fantastic. You mentioned just now the notion that some writers at least have avoided politics in, in their work because politics is, is real and and bloody. Mm -hmm. And we were talking before we started recording about uh, the real or, or realism in terms of mummy. So this book yeah. is is it's about puppy. It's about these. Yeah. It's about these patriarchal machista figures who promise so much, but what they deliver is is ambivalent. Yeah. They deliver. It's not that they don't deliver anything, but but they're, they're sort of unreliable. And at the end, mummy, especially at the end, but in the end. Yeah. We, we return to mummy and the book ends with mummy. And, and it, yes, you were talking about this as, as being something like the principle of, of, of reality or something. Can you say a little bit more of that? Yes, because one way or another way to approach this novel is to think of the major part of it as a dream sequence, right? Mm -hmm. you, 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 can, you can read the novel and this is all in the head of the narrator, right? This, this uh, pap is not gonna come, right? Uh, he left, he has other women, and, you know, she even fantasized about Papi's other women. Mm -hmm. But um, the last time I taught the novel, I, used, I, I, I told the students, look for the instances where mommy appears and what is happening, right? And it's always, is grounding the child, right? Uh, one particular thing is that she's she's talking about how Papi has all these rooms in the house, right? And he he doesn't even know how many rooms there's the house, and he cannot find how many suits, so he buys a new one, right? Every time he needs a shirt, he buys a new one, right? And then the narrator talks about how Mami and Sally have to share a bed. I have a, she has to share a bed with, with the grandmother and a mommy. 
because and and again it's reality that comes down and that ending like like you 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 said very well said is that this tenderness uh at the end right uh, and and mommy mommy as a body right as a, as a not as a as a figure of uh, a dream figure or a figment of the imagination but as a, as a sick body right like this mm-hmm. image mommy carrying mommy carrying the bag so i think it's very clever what rita indiana does here right papi it's all these success all these dreams all these deferred dreams or impossible dreams but then mommy is is the real mommy is the real world right and and i think you can make a parallel there and all this experimentation that it's happening for example that I'm founding in the 70s. The real is in the press. The real is in uh, the bodies that are lying in the streets. And the writers, you know, they talk about sets, they they make um, uh, experimental novels with uh, Greek mythology, even though life intervened in that particular novel, Escalera para Electra, which is in the 1970, Aida Cartagena por Talatín, she is Escalera para Electra. So she's dealing with Electra. and the, But there are instances in which there was a coup d'etat in my country, right? Mm-hmm. She's sending a letter from Greece. There was a coup d'etat in my country. Youth are dying in the streets. So, And then she comes back to, you know, being the biographer of this character. So this is what happening in real life in the 70s. And I think Rita Indiana gets that in the sense that one part is the dream, which is Papi and the Dominican York and the excess and capitalism and the night rider and all that. Mm-hmm. And the other part is mommy, where, you know, she's in the hospital. You have to share a bed. Uh, you have not enough toys, right? And your dreams will choke you like that um, uh, part when the life, the lifesaver dream mm-hmm. start strangling <laughs> the character, right? So for me, Mami, I haven't read it in a while, so I'm going to go back to that and check Mami again. Well, that invitation to reread is also something. This is a short book, and it can easily be reread. There's, yes. a, there's, there's a lot in this. Yes. And, and there's been a lot in this conversation. Again, Arturo, thank you so much for, thank your, you. for your time and expertise. This has been great. Thank you.